It's down to three-handed. When we look down at ace-5 suited in the big blind, with only three of us still playing, we've changed the structure a little bit. It's no longer a three-blind game. There's only a small blind and a big blind, but the stakes have been raised to 2550. Daniel's in the small blind. He raises to 150. We've probably got the best hand and we're in position. I three bet to 500. The small blind likes seeing flops. He calls quickly for 350 more. In this episode of Weekly Poker Hand, we are taking a look at a wild hand that Brad Owen played playing 2550, no limit hold'em. They are about $17,000 deep effective. I realize the graphic says something different. In this hand, small blind raises it up to 150 bucks. This is a scenario where the small blind should be doing a ton of limping in general, very, very deep stack. And if they do raise, they typically want to raise it bigger just to really disincentivize the big blind from playing. But whatever, it's 150 over round to Brad in the big blind with ace five of clubs. This is a great hand to raise it up, especially if you do not expect to get four bet very often. You really don't want to make it, let's say 500 and have your opponent make it 2200 in this scenario because then ace five suited shrivels up substantially. Uh, that said, this is a spot where I think most people are just not going to four bet nearly often enough. So, sure, three bet it up. Small blind calls. Let's head to the flop. We're heads up. The flop comes jack seven deuce with two clubs. We've got the flush draw with one over and a backdoor straight draw. It's a good hand at a full table. It's a monster three handed. The small blind checks. We've already missed one massive draw with ace high clubs earlier, making the likelihood of us hitting this one about 125%. I bet 650 to either win or build the pot for down the road when we inevitably do win now that Ben has gone back to his table. The small blind calls, it's time to hit the draw one time. The flop comes jack of clubs, seven of hearts, two of clubs. Small blind checks, Brad goes for a $650 bet, which seems perfectly fine and reasonable to me. If I was in his shoes, I may have bet even a little bit bigger on this very draw heavy board. You're gonna find that on boards that contain flush draws and or straight draws, you typically want to bet with a more polarized range of your best hands, some high equity draws and some medium or low equity draws. And when you are betting, you are betting using a bigger size. So while Brad bets 650, which is certainly big enough, maybe an ideal play would have been to go even a little bit bigger, like 850 or so, because when Brad does happen to make a flush, he wants to be able to reasonably get all the money in the pot. And if he bets with Ace five and his opponent folds any hand with any amount of equity. It's not the end of the world. That said, he goes 650. The opponent calls. Let's head to the turn. The turn is the nine of diamonds. A few random hands get there, including 10 eight, but I'm not all that concerned. The opponent checks. He may have called me light pre flop and on the flop. I'm keeping the pressure on when it's short handed. I bet 1500. I'd be okay with the fold. Part of me wants to see a call though. I just prefer not to get raised. The small blind calls. This is already a pot of over $5,000. We have one last shot at making the nuts. The turn is the nine of diamonds, which is not good for Brad's hand at all. The opponent checks, and now he has to figure out if he should continue bluffing. This is a situation where you do not need to bet with all of your flush draws, especially those that have a decent amount of showdown value, like ace high, because if you bet and get raised, it's pretty rough. And in this scenario, the opponent could certainly have lots of two pairs, lots of sets, and the straights. So again, as you expect to get check raised more often, you should be way, way, way more inclined to check behind with draws like this that really do not want to get raised. That said, if you can look and tell your opponent will never check raise the turn, or if you just know they don't like to check raise the turn in general, then betting's fine because you're pretty much always gonna to get to see the river and realize your equity. So I can go either way on the turn. Uh, Brad does go for a chunky bet, which he definitely should use if he is going to bet. This is a spot where, like on the flop, when you're betting the turn, you're gonna be very polarized to really good made hands and draws. And in that scenario, betting big is usually ideal. He goes 1500, his opponent calls. Let's see if he can spike on the river. The river is the four of hearts. It's a total blank. We need to call YouTube and schedule an appointment with the maintenance guy so that he can fix the like button. It seems to be broken. Small blind checks, our dream of making a big hand to win an enormous pot in order to get unstuck has been obliterated. The river is the four of hearts. Somehow Brad's 125% chance of making a flush did not come through this time. That's just unlucky. The opponent checks. Now Brad has to figure out what to do. But before we see what Brad does, I wanna know what would you do in this situation? The pot is $5,300. Would you check? Would you bet 3,000? 
Would you bet 7,000 or would you bet some other amount? Take a second, think about it, and let me know what you would do in the comments section down below. And while you're down there, you need to click the like button, the subscribe button, and the notification bell. Thank you. We've got ace high, which is unlikely to be good. The opponent already called a three bet and called two fairly large bets on the flop and turn. He doesn't strike me as the type who likes to fold to river bets. If we bet up to two thirds or even full pot, so we won't. This is a rough spot for Brad because it's tough to know what his range actually looks like. If we are playing in game theory optimal world, which we probably are not in this specific hand, but if we are, this is a spot where Brad will have a lot of busted gut shot straight draws, ace highs, and king highs. And when that is the case, you have to be careful to not bluff with all your potential bluffing hands, because if you do, you're going to have far too many bluffs in your range. And if your opponent realizes this, they can call with all of their bluff catchers. So does Brad have hands like ace five of diamonds or ace five of spades? in his range to bet the flop and keep betting on the turn, which you should do a decent amount of the time in game theory ultimate world. Does he have hands like king eight and queen eight? Those hands would love to bluff. Also in general, when you do have a lot of busted straight draws, you're gonna find that you really do not want to bet on the river with your busted flush draws, especially those that have some amount of showdown value because this ace five actually does have some showdown value. Notice it beats king queen, Queen 10, maybe Queen 8, if those decided to be a little bit loose and splashy. So this is a spot where in Game Theory Optimal World, Ace-5 of Clubs never bets. It actually just checks it back. However, we are playing in Texas, and we're also playing against perhaps someone whose range is not very well protected, and maybe they think that Brad doesn't like to bluff often enough on the river, or maybe they just will start finding folds with even hands like top pair. If that's the case, Blast him. No, no. We're gonna bet much, much bigger. I bet 7,000 into 5,300 to see if we can force our opponent out. It's over 1.3 times the size of the pot to put maximum pressure on. We three bet and continued betting the whole way, representing a monster. We never got raised like we probably would have if the opponent had two pair better on previous streets. We saw in an earlier hand that the opponent didn't slow play trips when there were even fewer draws to worry about on that board. I'm not very concerned that he slow played anything significant in this instance, and that's backed up by the agony that he seems to be in with his decision now. Oh. Don't turn the blender on because the opponent's in it. The tension is extremely high. If Daniel folds, our stack will climb to 20,000. If he calls, I'll be down to 8,000. I'll have lost over 15,000 for the day, and I'll likely be too tired and too tilted to continue playing well. The opponent gives us a clue as to what he's holding. When he says that, it sounds like he has a pair of jacks, maybe king jack or queen jack, which is towards the top end of what we were targeting. After what seems like an eternity, the small blind folds, we get one of the most exciting bluffs in my life through to win a huge amount of money. Daniel's been showing some of his bluffs. I've got to show him one of ours. Bluff. Got it through. All right, thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you. Brad gave it some thought, made a read, blasted his money in, and got the fold. Nice work.